Winslow again. This is uh, chapter 21 called Back to the Battlements. It is part two of Reading Log 16. This is your next three sentences uh, about what this chapter is about. Queen Adriana screamed and threw herself back like a Victorian lady having the vapors. But I figured it was calculated drama for she didn't lose herself the moment enough to fall back off the bench. Oriole rushed to her side and fanned her to say, Dare, dare, which, meant, which might have meant that Ariel was easily fooled, or more likely that she was smart enough to pretend she was easily fooled. What happened? I asked Sister Mary Ursula. Wolfgall was returning from Fairfield, leading the wagons, bearing the recovered gold. Ooh, Sister Mary Ursula said, paused and considered. Gold! She shook her head disapprovingly. True, it is of the earth and comes from the earth, but if ever there is a thing which should cause more diversion, division rather than oneness. Sister Mary Ursula, Queen Adriana bellowed, having recovered at least the strength of her voice. Get on with what's happened to my son. He must have been feeling a certain oneness since Sister Mary Ursula said, refusing to be put entirely off, for he didn't send scouts ahead, and so he stumbled into the barbarian camp and was captured. I would have said once a scout, Abbas grumbled, no matter how one I felt. Yes, dear, Adriana said, but that's you. I was thinking that Wolfgar might, being what he was, would should have a certain advantage in a surprise attack. Not sure how many people knew of his ability to transform into a wolf. Not wanting to give anything that I shouldn't, I said, perhaps Wolfgar, being the clever person he is, might have managed to escape. Sister Mary Ursula asked, you mean by turning into a wolf? which goes to show that not every situation calls for subtlety. No, the barbarian messenger specifically said that that didn't work. Messenger, I echoed. The barbarian sent a messenger? Well, of course there's a messenger. How else would I know what had happened? Captain Penrod sent me to ask you to come to the north battlement. Again, my brothers moved faster than I. One of the disadvantages of wearing a dress, particularly a dress five sizes too big. But I was ahead of Adriana, Deming, and Oriole, and way ahead of Sister Mary Ursula, and once again, Aldemar. Looking over the parapet, I saw the barbarian messengers had walked at this time, and had one of our guards as prisoners. The guard was holding a sack, and a pile of gold was pouring out at his feet, proof that the man was not a simple deserter, one of the group that had been accompanying the gold. I called down. If you think that's Prince Wolfgar, you're mistaken. Toh! The barbarian spat. People in this world really seem fond of spitting. Uh, he said, Wolfgar is the one being what can be changed himself into a wolf. He is being our captive. And we take your word for that, I asked. The barbarian gave the prisoner a shake. Tell, he commanded. The guard was nodding. The prince is alive, he assured us. He was asleep in one of the wagons when the barbarian surrounded us. He changed into a wolf, but was struck in the shoulder by an arrow. Though he's injured, he will recover. Sure, one of us got some rest. I thought grumpily, though it was hardly a fair grievance considering that how now he was captive and wounded. I also thought, am I uh, the only one in this kingdom who didn't know Wolfgar was a wolf? Meanwhile, I called down to the barbarian, what are you offering? The life of a prince for the life of a princess. To my surprise and gratification, there was a roar of protest from my men on the battlements. But before I could get too smug, 
Abbas, sentimental softy that he was, nudged me and asked, Ask if the trade includes the gold too. Deming said, This situation is more emotionally wrenching than before, but we cannot give in to their demands. Thank you, Deming. I was glad to have a refusal that sounded like a political stance rather than cowardice. I yelled down, We do not bargain with extortioners. But remember this, harm Wolfgar and you will lose any chance to negotiate later. Two, the barbarian spat, which came as no surprise, but then he slit the throat of the hostage, which did come as a surprise. Our men released a flurry of arrows, deeming he had broken the truce first, but he was at the border of their range and quickly sprinted back to his own lines. Adriana said to me, that's what they'll do to Wolfgard too, and it's all your fault. I half expected her to spit too, but fortunately she didn't. She turned and headed to the stairs. Out of my way, you old fool, I heard her say. Sister Mary Ursula hefted her, herself up the last steps, hopping like a beached whale. Adriana pushed past her, and Abbas and Kendrick followed, with Oriel close behind and Deming behind her. Sister Mary Ursula asked, Did I miss anything? I ignored her and asked Penrod, Did you see Zenas come, through, come walking out of the castle through the walls a short while ago? Though that should have been hard to miss, he said, Through the walls, princess? And shook his head. No, princess. Or did you notice a bat, maybe? A uh, bat? I waved my arms to indicate flapping wings. Hard to say, princess, Penrod said. Usually bats don't come out until dusk. It didn't make any difference. I doubted Aldmar could, use, could, could get Zenas to return, even if, as a bat, using his sonar sense instead of eyes, Aldmar could find him. Perhaps thinking that I had become mentally unbalanced, Penrod said, You should take what rest you can now, princess. When the sun sets, they'll resume their attack. Maybe a two-hour nap would make me feel like a new person. Or would it just give all my overworked muscles time to stiffen? Better, I thought, to stay in the guard's view, helping, getting their attention in a good way, lest they reconsider how much they had to gain by turning me over to the barbarians. Let's get these men fed, I told Penrod. I'm sorry, I lost my place. Oh, there will be little time for that later. Sister Mary Ursula said, Oh no, not the stairs again. Sorry, I told her. I tried to think of something useful to occupy her. Could you organize the ladies into making bandages? I am one with the chickadee. She answered, I am mother and sister and child of the deer the moment before the hunter's arrows pierce its heart heart. I had no idea if that meant yes or no, or if she was simply de declaring she was a vegetarian. The guards stayed on the walls in case the barbarian attack came sooner than we expected, so that their food had to be brought up to them. I tried to help pages, but frankly I was more bothered than benefit because I had to hold up my skirt, my skirts up out of the way of going up those stairs and that's hard to do while carrying heavy trays of food because the ghost kept getting in everyone's way on the crowded stairwell maybe the head page suggested it would be best if you just stayed up here to helping to distribute the food i ended up dolling out the mead which had to be the best job i could have to make them appreciate me for they seemed to like drinking better than eating but all the while, the shadows were lengthening, and the edge of the sky got pink, and the pages scurried, scurried to clean up before the battle began, and the trays and barrels and dishes became a hazard to the men who would be defending our lives. I pounded the lid back onto the barrel of mead, 
with the butt of the knife one of the men loaned me for that purpose. And did you take time to eat? Someone asked from behind me. I turned to see Kendrick. My happiness was of, of, at his concern was diminished by the sight of Oriole standing by him. He was carrying a huge wicker laundry basket filled with rags, and he put, and he put this down by my feet. Ah, uh, I thought, Sister Mary Ursula's bandage brocade was has been at work. Kendrick said, "Oriole, go fetch Janine something to eat before we they bring back, bring everything back to the kitchen, will you?" I thought she might be bristled at being spoken to as though she were a servant, but she only said, certainly, and went to intercept one of the pages. Kendrick nodded towards the bandages and said, Oriole has doused these with a potion that will help promote healing. Well, that was kind of her, I said. Oriole grinned, or Kendrick grinned. Oriole doesn't do things out of kindness. She works for pay. Well, so maybe the two of them weren't as cozy as I had thought. Hmm. Oriole came back bearing a bowl of stew and a hunk of bread. You aren't being very kind, she complained to Kendrick. I don't always demand to be paid. She handed me the bowl. I very much admire how you are handing yourself, she told me, to go from the quiet life you've been used to. Hmm. I can't imagine. My father ran out on us when I was born with the witch's mark on me. Another no account father, I thought, as she held up her palm to show a pentagram that seemed to be etched into her skin. My mother tried to drown me when I was just seven and I was raised in the gutter. I'm used to betrayal and deception and people trying to use me but you're doing this all by your own, no needing anybody and not having to play men's games. She drifted off and I knew she meant not having to flirt or act sexy, which I figured I couldn't have done anyway, but I didn't think she was putting me down for not looking like a cover girl. It didn't sound as though, as though her fabulous looks had given her a happy life. In fact, she said, I envy you so much. Wait, somebody who looked like Oreo envied me? I've got an idea, Oreo said. How about if we send Kendrick away, and then we can discuss what's wrong with men and the way they run the world? I beg your pardon, Kendrick said. What's wrong with men? Nothing, Oreo said. Nothing is every wrong, anything wrong with men. It's always somebody else's fault. That's a stereotype, Kendrick pointed out. It was, but I couldn't help throwing in a joke I had heard. Hey, Oriole, if a man is all alone in the forest with no one to hear him, is he still wrong? <laughs> Oriole laughed. So, Kendrick said, should I just leave the two of you on your own then? We waved him away and sat down on the battlement. This stew is the best thing I've eaten all day. It is the only thing you've eaten all day, she pointed out. It was venison, which I wouldn't have chosen even before Sister Mary Ursula commented about poor hunted, hunted deer. But I was hungry enough that I was willing to eat Bambi's mother. Watching Kendrick, who had gone to stand by Abbas, Oriole said, Hmm, I admit those three are good looking that they are, I agreed. But if I hear Abbas brag one more time about how many roast ducks he can eat in one sitting, or how many cows he can live with one arm, I said, do the words Spanish steel mean anything to you? And in unison, with a great deal of pomponicity, we both said, Toledo, and then giggled as though we were safe in the school cafeteria. Oriole said, and of course, you can't trust Kendrick. So I've heard, I said, thinking of Nigel Rasmussen's warning. And Wolfga, come the full moon, he is impossible. I can imagine. 
<sighs> but they look so, so distracting. I nodded, but I shifted uncomfortably. The stew seemed to be sitting in a lump somewhere between my throat and my stomach. Is something wrong? Oriel asked. I set down the bowl of stew. I think I ate too fast after not eating for so long. I tugged at the neckline of my dress. I really should change out of this velvet monstrosity. I'm just so hot. The day was ending. Shouldn't it be cooling off? My lips felt parched and I went to lick them, but my tongue was so dry and heavy, I couldn't move it. I tried to say, isn't it getting awfully hot? But my voice only came up a thick and garbled. Besides, I could see it wasn't getting hot. Some of the other men had actually put it on cloaks against the evening chill. Though my body was still hot, my heart went cold. It's not fair, I thought. I'm doing well. I'm going to finish this game this lifetime. But I had taken too long to get here. To damage the Rasmussen computers were overloading my brain. I was beginning to die. No! I cried defiantly, but it was little more than a moan. Here, let me get you something to drink, Oriel offered. I saw her stand, but I felt as though I were looking through the wrong end of a telescope. And either she was tipping, or I was. Must be me, I reasoned, for the parapet was at an odd angle, too. Kendrick came up to Oriel and put his arm around her waist. Not feeling well, is she? <laughs> he asked. Fevered and delirious, Oriel said. Ah, oh, hmm, what a pity, Kendrick said, not looking or sounding the least bit pitying. Neither did Oriel come to think of it. Captain Penrod, though, came rushing over. He did look distressed. Princess, he cried. He took hold of me and sat me up straight. I know only because I could see him do it. I could feel his ar his hands around my arms. My neck was no longer strong enough to even hold my head up. I couldn't feel anything. And I told myself, don't panic. It could be worse. Not feeling anything is better than feeling pain. But that didn't truly really help. Abbas must have joined the group. What's the matter with her? I heard him ask. Fevered and delirious. Kendrick said. Just like father, Abbas commented dryly. <laughs> Just like father, Kendrick echoed. And then I did feel something. Thank God. I felt fizziness engulf my body. <laughs>